Hi there. Um, I've decided to do a, a, a video blog, I guess it's called, in response to someone called, I don't know, a page for president. He has commented quite a few times on my YouTube. And he says, can you do a vlog about the silent period? So I'll do that. And I'll talk about what I call passive learning, the silent period. Take my glasses off. I don't really have to read anything. No, one thing I wanted to mention, there was another person who said, I've been practicing Russian for almost half a year. Palletization is a tricky thing to do. I'll deal with that quickly and then I'll get to uh, the question of the silent period and, uh, and uh, passive learning. Palletization. I haven't a clue what palletization is. I've um, been learning Russian on my own. I listen, I repeat, I try to get the sounds. I don't know what palletization is. I think the more we create special terms for different things uh, in the language, in the different languages, the more we confuse the learner. I have no interest in knowing what palletization is. It's not a problem. Uh, passive learning and uh, the silent period. I believe that, that language learning is an intensely personal task. It's you, the learner, and the language. The teacher is a resource if you want the teacher, but fundamentally it's between you and the language. You have to like the language. Um, you have to look for content. Uh, it's easier now because of the tremendous number of podcasts and blogs and other resources that are available on the internet. You have to discover the language. You have to pick up on the rhythm of the language. Uh, you have to learn the words in the language. Uh, all of these things are you and the language. It's quite a draining thing. It's very enjoyable, but it's it's very exhausting because it grabs you, takes hold of you, and um, and you're transforming yourself. To you're adding another layer to your personality. And the longest, the, the first long period of that is is you doing it with the language, in a largely passive way. You're reading you're listening, you're listening over and over again. You may be repeating, I think repeating out loud is a good thing to do. Uh, that's helping you catch the rhythm of the language. Uh, you're listening sometimes to the language spoken slowly, sometimes to the language spoken more quickly. For long periods of time, content that you are listening to is not very clear, like it's, it's you can't really pick out where the words begin and end sometimes. You know the words, but you can't make out the whole meaning, you just have a vague sense of the meaning, and gradually everything starts to fall into place. And that process can take you six months to a year. Uh, I mean, it can take for a long, long time, even longer, because there will always be um, aspects of the language, situations, movies, conversations with people, whatever, that you continue not to understand. But the amount the, the, the area of the language that you're able to understand, that it starts be, to become clear to you and natural to you, gets larger and larger. And so you get a natural feeling for the language and your vocabulary increases. And during that period of getting acquainted with the language, I don't personally feel any urgency to speak. Uh, I have not sought out people with whom to speak Russian, which is the language that I've been learning recently. Obviously, if I stumble on someone who is a Russian speaker, I will try out my Russian. It's fun. Uh, I was even in a situation in Holland after I'd only been listening to Russian for about six months where a blind Russian person in this Dutch hotel was not being properly looked after and was obviously uh, in a state of anxiety and I, even with my limited Russian, was able to help him and make him feel comfortable and tell him what time he was supposed to get the bus and so forth, because the hotel staff are too busy to look after him properly. And so I was very satisfied that I was able to use the Russian that I had learned, but I have no great urgency to speak it, and I'm not losing anything in my opinion. That's not to say that it isn't a good thing, I'm just going to occasionally watch my time here. I'm not saying that it's not, a, where is my time on this thing anyways? Uh, obviously it's a good thing to speak. Oh, there we are. It's a good thing to speak. Uh, speaking does a number of things for you. It, it forces you to try to remember the things that you have been learning passively. And I think that helps to prime the pump uh, and then makes you, you know, better able to remember things. Uh, it makes you conscious of where your gaps are. It makes you conscious of things that you can't say, words that you don't have. 
so that you start to look for those in your listening and reading. Uh, it's a challenge, so to the extent that you meet the challenge, it's satisfying. To the extent that you don't meet the challenge, it can be sometimes a bit discouraging. Sometimes it's a little bit stressful. It's a fun thing to do. You don't need a lot of it, in my opinion. Uh, if uh, after maybe a month or two of dedicated listening, a lot of listening to repetitive listening to simple content, uh, you gradually start to move on to more difficult content, you have a bit of vocabulary, then you might want to speak once a week. That's enough. If you're fortunate enough to be in the country where the language is spoken, or you have a friend, and then if you have access to more opportunities, speak fine, go for it. But it's not crucial. To me, you, you need that first period to build up the vocabulary, the familiar, familiarity with the language. You know, I often uh, de-emphasize grammar, but obviously you've got to get some sense of how the language works uh, initially by observation, and there's nothing wrong with having a small grammar book where you, you know, just have a quick summary of it. Don't try to remember any of the explanations, but just to get some sense, like, okay, learning Russian, that. Uh, you know, the past tense uh, ends in an L and that the, the feminine past tense is an LA. So they actually have a feminine form of the past tense determined by like the speaker. Uh, so, you know, these are a few little things like that. But uh, when you get into the more complex explanations, the conditionals, the modals, the, the subjunctives, the, uh, the uh, perfective verbs in Russian, all this kind of stuff, the, the explanations for the different cases and so forth, there's just no way. So get some sense of how the language works and then start to observe the language, listen to the language, like the language, get the rhythm, like the music, expand your vocabulary. This can be six to six months to a year or longer. I mean, I have been in a sense, I have been doing it for two years because I have no real need to speak Russian. I very much enjoy my reading now that I'm reading Russian history, I'm reading Russian literature of the 19th century, I'm listening to audiobooks of the same material. That's what I like to do. I'm happy doing what I'm doing with the language. I am meeting my objectives in the language. And at the same time, I'm, I'm building myself up so that should I go to Russia, uh, or, you know, not so long ago I went to a, an evening of Russian theater here in Vancouver, and there was a lady sitting beside me, an older lady, yeah, I've got to be careful who I call older because I'm not that young myself, but I was able to carry on a conversation with her in Russian. We talked about the play and we talked about different things and that was a great source of satisfaction. So if it's there, yes, but I don't go out looking for it. And I think that we can do a lot of good to ourselves if we focus on this passive learning. Uh, no teacher correcting you. Uh, no need to perform, no need to feel inadequate, uh, nothing wrong with passive vocabulary. It hasn't yet converted itself into active vocabulary, so what? Uh, I take great satisfaction in, in the fact that I've accumulated enough vocabulary so that I can read, uh, you know, serious books. Uh, good enough. Um, so, and, and I don't, and, and this is the other thing, I don't got to careful, it's got to be under 10 minutes here, but um, all this business about helping you read, reading strategies, uh, pre-reading, post-reading. I mean, I bought this uh, Russian textbook and they had all kinds of like 12 or 15 different things to do before and after you read. No, just read and listen, enjoy it. And Ruben Alves really stresses this and he, and he says somewhere, he says, there is nothing as incompatible with the enjoyment of reading as much as this whole business of analyzing and interpreting and, and explaining what you have just read. The important thing is to enjoy the music of the language, to enjoy the sounds of the language, to enjoy the, 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 the wonders of literature, of communicating with a person of a different century, of a different con country, a different culture in his language, and uh, to get to that stage as quickly as you can. So, Silent period, six months, one year, 18 months, depending on your circumstances, it's a great way to learn. You shouldn't feel under any obligation to speak and therefore be wary of going to courses where they force you to speak. And thank you. Goodbye for now.